Thanks for joining us online. We really are grateful for the opportunity to be able to connect with you. Whether you're a regular here at LBCC, perhaps you're another follower of Jesus and you're just stopping in to see what we're doing, or maybe you're a person who's curious about the teachings of Christianity and the things that Jesus had to say. Our aim is simple as a church. First, we want to connect you. Connect you to Jesus, that is, who is the source of all life and goodness. And while we're doing that, we want to connect you to community, because community is God's idea, and everyone's better off when they're with other people. Secondly, we want to help you grow as a person. People are meant to grow. We're meant to improve and learn and grow and mature as people. When you grow in your relationship with God, it becomes dynamic and changes your life. When you grow in relationships with other people, it helps you have a full life and purpose in life. That brings me to the third aim. Our third aim is to help you invest your life in something bigger than yourself. Everyone knows that, that if we look inward, we often get lost and lose our moorings. But it's the people that take their lives and, and do something with it, invest in something way bigger than themselves, that know that they have purpose and meaning in their life. Of course, the gospel is the greatest thing you could invest your life into. It's a, it's a mission, it's a, a goal that goes well beyond you. But you should also be investing in your family, in your town, in your, any place in your community you can. When you do these three things, connect, grow and invest, your life is on the kind of track that it should be. Thank you again for joining us online. Here are some of the ways you can connect, grow, and invest at LBCC. We host breakfasts for women and men on the second and fourth Saturday mornings of every month. You can sign up at lbcovenant.org slash welcome slash upcoming dash events. Also, check out our life groups, a great way to meet and get to know us better. Some meet in person, others on Zoom, either weekly or a couple of times a month. Of course, visit our website or call the office at 732-870-2028 to get info or ask for prayer. We'd love to help you in any way we are able. Now here's today's sermon. Well, if you've been with us, we've been working our way through um, a series called Finding Your Place in God's Big Story. And we've been using a book called Living God's Word by Hayes and Duval, which is an overview of the whole scripture, starting from Genesis through Revelation, realizing that this is one big story about Jesus, leading to Jesus. And we've, we, we're in the New Testament right now, and last week I talked about, um, uh, Ray talked two weeks ago about the coming of the Spirit and the birth of the church, and last week I talked about the church beginning to minister in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria, and today we're going to look at we're going to look at the uh, uh, church. Um, it, it's the, in the mission to the Gentiles. So, over these three weeks, we're covering Acts. Uh, Ray Ray did Acts one and two, and I'm covering Acts. 3 through 28 in three weeks. So it's an awful lot. It's an awful lot. But we're trying to give you the, the overarching picture and have you go into it there. So God's big story is uh, that we can look at different aspects of it. But right now we're looking, we're looking for the, what the church's role is. And so our title for these three weeks is Church is on a Mission there. Um, we started, uh, I started last week, uh, and I believe, again, Ray used it the week before, with Jesus' words from uh, Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, which echo, which echo Matthew 28. He said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you shall be my witnesses, telling everyone about me, telling people everywhere, about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And so we, we've been looking at this. I'm going to do a little review, and then we'll do a little history this morning. And then I'm going to give us, I think, what is one of our doorways into it, a way for us to, to be um, applying what we're learning, applying what we're seeing here. So I said last week that, that there were three simple keys to this mission. 
We looked at how they did so much in one generation. And for us, it's that we want to learn from history, see what they did, and imitate them. We want to see the big picture. That's a great challenge for us today. We get so involved in details and our own lives and the stuff that matters to us, and we lose sight of the big picture of what the, the Lord is doing through the Scripture. And then we want to be led by the Spirit. You know, what the Spirit did through Jesus' ministry when he walked on earth, he now did then through the apostles and then through the community, and he wants to cause us to do the same thing. We want to be led by the Spirit and f advance the gospel message in the kingdom. Now, what did they do? In, in one generation, they took, they took the, the gospel from Jerusalem all the way to Rome. In about 60-plus years, they did that. And they didn't, have, they didn't have email. They didn't have the Internet. They didn't have cars. Most of them didn't have chariots. They had ships they could take out, and they walked. They could walk about 20 miles a day. And it's, it's just amazing what they did. Now, last week, we looked at kind of the birth of the church and where they went from there, and we kind of ended with, with the going out. And remember what it said. It said that after, after Stephen was martyred, after he gave his great sermon and they loved it so much, they stoned him to death. Um, it said a great wave of persecution began that day, sweeping over the church in Jerusalem. And all the believers except for the apostles were scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. Now a couple of verses later it says this, but the believers who were scattered Preach the good news about Jesus wherever they went. So the, their circumstances and the difficulties that they were facing did not stop them from the mission. Um, they may not even have realized this was part of God's plan, to get out of the comfort zone and go forth. You know? And so what I looked at last week is that we want to see the book of Acts not as a, a series of random events or even related events. We want to look at it for our sake as a mission progress report. You know? So what did we cover last week? We covered last week, we, we looked at Stephen's death at the end of uh, chapter 7 and, and into chapter 8. And then we looked, I just read that verse, the first scattering of the church being pushed out of Jerusalem and chased out of Jerusalem. This happened a number of times to the church. The book of Romans is written to people who are Gentiles leading the church in Rome, and the emperor had kicked all the Jews out of Rome, and so the church, which began as Jewish Christians, became a Gentile church, and now the Jews were coming back in, and Paul had to remind them, the Gentiles there, to treat the Jewish believers coming back the right way. That's a, a good part of what Romans is about. And so then we had this first scattering there. Then we see that uh, we see it going forth in Samaria. What happened is some people went to Samaria and only preached to the Jews. And then other people came and preached to, the, to all of the Samaritans who were, they were half Jews, most of them. And um, we, see, uh, we see Philip in Samaria uh, working great deeds with them, preaching to them. And then Peter and John came down to Samaria and, and, and prayed that they'd be filled with the Holy Spirit. And they believed and had been baptized under Philip, and now they got filled with the Spirit. Then in chapter, chapter 9, uh, uh, this is after all this scattering has begun, we see Paul's conversion in chapter 9. And then in chapter 10, we see we see Peter preaching to the Gentiles where he has the vision. He had gone over to Joppa to pray for someone and he stays there and now he gets this vision uh, probably because he was really hungry. I don't know. It says he was really hungry and he's praying and he got this vision. And, and it was uh, all unclean foods and we'll look at that in a couple of minutes. And so he preaches to these Gentiles
Before he's done preaching, the Holy Spirit fills, falls on the room and he baptizes them. And then later he's got to go uh, tell them why he did that back in Jerusalem. And then if we go, if we jump to Acts 11, we see continued scattering of the church. It's being pushed out. It's being pushed out of there because while they're having great success, they're also facing opposition and seeing trouble. And that trouble's that trouble is just constantly moving them outside of their comfort zone into new places, and wherever they go, they preach the gospel. Now, let's, I want to take a couple of minutes and look at the timeline of Paul's journey, because so much of the book of Acts is about Paul's ministry. Basically, Peter and Paul are the two main uh, advocates of the gospel, leading their teams uh, in, the, in the book of uh, Acts. So what we see here in Paul's life is, of course, Jesus was, was crucified probably in 32 or 33 uh, AC, uh, not BC, 32 AD, AD we'll call it. They have different names for it now. So in about 33, um, we see that Paul gets converted. Again, if you look at different uh, references, th these years are a little bit this way, a little bit that way, because the scholars are re reconstructing this from all different sources. But these are all pretty close. So Paul gets converted in, in uh, the year 33. And then in 33 to 36, it tells us that Paul spent some time in Damascus and then went out in Arabia by himself for almost three years. Later, he talks about that in Galatians, where he, he basically met with the Lord uh, on his own, and so much was revealed to him as he pursued God and did this. And so in 36, it says that he was, he was after he came out of Arabia in this time alone, um, he goes and visits Jerusalem. And again, in, in Galatians, it tells us that he spent a couple of weeks in Jerusalem with Peter and also with James, uh, Jesus' brother, who was at the time the head of the church in Jerusalem. And so he goes there, but then, of course, he, he starts preaching, and he's really bold, and he starts making so much trouble, they say, you know, you should go home for a while. We don't know quite how to do it. But basically, in 36, they after he visits there, they send him back to Tarsus. He goes back to Damascus and ends up back in Tarsus, his home, his home city. And he stays there for four years, it says, for four years. Now, during this time, the, the, the outward push, they've gone into Syria. They've been going, and again, they went into Antioch in Syria. There's an Antioch over in, over in Asia, minor too, but this Antioch in Syria, straight up the coast. And what happens there is in, in Antioch, the, the people who end up there, they first start preaching just to the Jews. And then some begin to preach to the Gentiles. And the and the, the gospel just explodes in Antioch. It just starts growing and becoming so big, they send Barnabas up there from Jerusalem, and Barnabas reports that he found the grace of God there, saw the hand of God working, and the church is growing, and they're sending teachers there, and Paul then, I mean Barnabas then, who, who, who vouched for Paul back in the beginning, he goes over to Tarsus and brings brings uh, Paul back there. And Paul spends uh, a, couple of, a couple of years there, uh, at least a year, it tells us in Scripture, teaching and strengthening the church there. Now, in that same time, uh, or just right in that time, in 42, what happens is a prophet arises uh, and, tell, and prophesies of a great famine that's coming over the land. And so the church there uh, begins to take an offering and s save money. And so it says somewhere around 46 to 47, they take this, this relief to Jerusalem and, and, and bless Jerusalem with it. And then they come, they come back to Antioch from there. Oops, let me get that up there. So they come back to Antioch from there, 
And that begins from Antioch, the first missionary journey. So for two years, then, Paul's out on the road with Barnabas and I think others. And then, uh, that, yeah, that's in Acts 13 and 14. When you want to, you got, you've got to go and do all this reading later, right? And then after that, we have the Jerusalem Council. So he comes back from that. So now it's 49. The last time he was in Jerusalem was 35 or 36. Because he says, he says uh, in Galatians that it was a 14-year gap. So that's, again, you're just you're trying to guess the exact time. So he goes back to Jerusalem 14 years later and says to Peter and the apostles there, this is what I'm preaching among the Gentiles. Because he tells the Galatians, he says, I want to make sure I wasn't preaching in vain. So 14 years later, he does this. And they send him out and they say, just, you know, we're not going to add this. You know, of course, they were also dealing with people that were telling the Gentiles, oh, you've got to be circumcised. You've got to keep all the law of Moses. And he's like, no, 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 no. You don't have to do that. And this was confirmed at the Jerusalem Council that they should abstain from meat uh, um, offered to idols. And that was mostly to not cause the Jewish believers to stumble. Uh, because it wouldn't have mattered that much to the Gentiles. And he told them to look out for the poor and to not add any other burdens to them. And Paul goes back with that. So then he goes back to Antioch, and then he's got, uh, then we have the, the second missionary journey from 50 to 52, which is Acts 15 to 18. Um, and, then, and then we have the third missionary journey, which was 53 to 57. And you see that in Acts 18 to 21. And during that time, probably from Antioch in, chapter, in, in, in the year 49 is when he wrote Galatians back to, back to them and said, look, it, don't let them get you doing this stuff. You, know, don't, you don't need to be circumcised. You know, the gospel we gave you is the only gospel. In 50 through 52, uh, probably from Corinth, he wrote First and Second Thessalonians, and then during that time of the of the third missionary trip, he wrote probably from Ephesus. He wrote Galatians. Um, uh, this is the other um, other uh, theory. Uh, in First and Second Corinthians, were probably written in that period, probably one from Ephesus and one from Macedonia, and somewhere in that time, he wrote the Book of Romans, hoping to go to Rome one day. So we see these, these years from 33 AD when Paul was saved to 57 AD, um, so 20 plus years of his life. He's, uh, he's been given to this missionary journey and all of these things that we read about in Acts and we read about in the, in the epistles of all the ups and downs and the challenges he faced. But that never stopped him or the people he was walking with from continuing on the mission. Now, Paul, Paul's a unique person because, you know, we know people who sacrifice for the gospel, but he, I mean, he just, he gave it all up. He gave it all up. In fact, after he got saved, remember, he was struck blind. And he ends up in this house waiting, and they send somebody to, the Lord speaks to this man. He says, go speak to him and pray for him and re help him restore his sight and tell him this, I'm going to show him what he's going to suffer for my name's sake. It's like, you know, if I was going to give a missionary call right now, I probably wouldn't start with, wait a wait, do you see how much you're going to suffer? You know, God loves you and he wants to use you and you're going to suffer. You're going to see how much, oh, it's going to be amazing. That's basically the call he responded to. So he's quite a guy. He's quite a guy. Now, let's, let's, I, I'm, this is, we're going to race through this one here. So here's, here's the first missionary journey. I got it. I can send you these if you want to look. I actually have ones that the, the arrows move and stuff like that. But I couldn't get it big enough, so. And then the second one, a lot of, a lot of stuff in ships there. And, 
that sort of things. And there's problems because in the first journey, John Mark left them, so Paul wouldn't take them in the second journey. And then the third journey is, of course, the longest, all through Asia and Macedonia and Achaia, ending up in, in Athens and everything. And if you, if you take some time, and it's going to get me to more what I want to really talk about this morning. If you take time to read about these journeys and follow your way historically through the, through the book of Acts and see what was going on with them and what they were doing, you may, you may find some of the answers, or, or at least an answer to one what I think is a very important question for us. My question is this, what set them apart from so many of today's believers? When I look at my life and I look at their lives, I say, what, I can see some similarities, but I also see some things about them that when I see what they accomplished in their lives, I have to say, what sets them apart from that? And, and I don't know that this is all of it, but I'll tell you one thing that's there, is that they were listening to the Spirit. These were men and women who listened when God spoke by the Spirit, and in the Word, of course. Um, and when I say listen, I don't mean just hear audibly. I mean, I mean what a parent means when they tell their kid, you're not listening to me. What you're really saying is you're not heeding what I'm saying. You're not obeying what I'm telling you to do. So you tell your kid to, you know, go clean your room, and they walk off because they heard you, but you go and check their room, and you realize they didn't listen to you because they're doing something other than cleaning. You know, they listened. The one thing I see woven through the lives of these people is that they listened to the Spirit. You know, we too often, I believe, in our generation, in our world, we look for God to confirm our plans rather than change our plans to fit his plans. You know, I think we have other challenges. We, we, we live in a world where it seems that people are either spirit-led or scripture-led. And that is so dumb because... The scripture is, is inspired by the spirit, you know. Um, we don't need to choose between them two. The scripture unfolds God's insight and wisdom to us, and the spirit illuminates and confirms the scripture to us. Yvonne and I were visiting a church, and the pastor said he just loved uh, leading a, a presence-led church. And I'm like, what does that mean? And what, what it seemed to mean is like whatever they felt was happening right then was what they would do. And I'm like, eh, I see some merit to that, but, you know, I would like a little content here, you know. And we never actually heard anybody preach that day. And, and the songs had very little content. There's a couple of phrases that over and over. We're pretty sure they love God. And we're pretty sure they thought God was cool. But we never sang about God and who he was or his attributes or anything like that. And I, yeah, I know I can be critical. I, 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 for years, I thought that was one of the gifts of the spirit, criticism. But I mean, these were wonderful people. It was a wonderful group of people. The spirit was present in the meeting, but... But it had a sense that it was like, well, whatever we feel like God's saying today. And there's got to be a, a right, I, I won't even use the word balance, there's got to be a right sinking or synergy between listening to the Spirit and knowing and being led by the Word and being guided by the Word. If you believe the Holy Spirit's speaking to you, you should be able to find something in the Scripture. But you definitely shouldn't find anything in the Scripture that says no to what you say. think the Holy Spirit's saying to you. you know? I mean, I, I've had people tell me that the Lord told me to leave my, my wife. <laughs> no, he didn't. No, he didn't. You know? So, 
We need, to, we need to be a people that listen to the Spirit, understanding that we are guided by the Word. And it, and it all starts in our hearts. Are we listening with intent to obey? Or are we listening to hear what we want to hear? Paul Simon, that great prophet, in his song, The Boxer, said, a man hears what he wants to hear and disregards the rest. And doesn't that... Doesn't that you know, that's what I see sometimes when I look in the mirror. Somebody who wants to hear what they want to hear. But we have to be willing to hear whatever God wants to say to us and be ready to act upon it. Hayes and Duval, the writers of the book that we've been using, say it this way. Listening to Jesus requires a reorientation of one's heart and an opening of one's heart to what God thinks is best. And what I want to show you this morning is that this is the way our heroes of the faith did it. Well, this is the way, this is the way, if we're going to be people that learn to listen, this is, this is the way we got to go. And let's face it, Jesus listened. You know, Je Jesus listened to the Spirit. It tells us in, in uh, Matthew chapter 4, verse 1, that Jesus was led by the Spirit into, into the wilderness to be tempted by Satan. And so, like, you know, if, if, if you're saying, hey, there's the wilderness over there. Oh, you should go over there and uh, where it's horrible. The conditions are terrible. It's not comfortable. It's cold. There's nothing to eat. And, oh, by the way, the devil's waiting for you. You'd think, oh, no, God wouldn't want me to go there. But God wanted him to go there. One of the speakers yesterday quoted the fact that, that Paul said, you know, I have this thorn in my side, and I want God to take it away. And I asked him three times, and the Lord said, no, my grace is sufficient. Yeah. So we have to realize that listening to God, listening to God, often means that he may take us, or at least sometimes must mean that, that he will take us to places we don't expect to go or perhaps would rather not go. Jesus listened. Jesus had said this, For I did not speak on my own, but the Father himself who sent me has given me a commandment as what to say and what to speak. Don't we read throughout the Gospels over and over that Jesus went away by himself to pray? He went and found a quiet place where he could commune with God and listen to the Father. Now, Jesus did what he did as a man filled and led by the Spirit. So if, if we want to be in any way like these people in the book of Acts, we need, to, we need to be learning to listen all the time. Jesus listened. And then we see that Peter listened. Peter listened to the vision. In Acts chapter 10, we see, we see this account I mentioned before. He's up on the roof, and it says a voice came to him after he saw this vision of a sheet coming down, and on it was all these foods that the Gentiles eat, unclean to the Jews. And the voice said, Arise, Peter, kill and eat. And, and, or this one says, get up, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, by no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything unholy or unclean. And the word goes on to say, the Lord goes on to say, well, God has cleansed, no longer consider unholy. This happened three times, and immediately the object was taken up in the sky. Now, if you read the whole context, before this vision, God had already spoken to Cornelius. And Cornelius sends men to get him. The angel says, go send and look for this man. And he's staying with Simon the Tanner and, and Joppa. Go get him at his house and bring him to yourself. He'll tell you what I have to say to you. And so he's up there and, and, he, and it says then, it says, behold, three men are looking for you. Behold, but get up, go downstairs and accompany them without misgivings, for I have sent them myself. So he gets up and he spends time with them and then they go back to the, the Gentile's house, Cornelius' house. He even comes in and he starts his sermon by, you know, Jews aren't supposed to be here. You know, if you read anything on how to start a talk, it's never offend your audience. You know, I'm used to speaking to better looking people. 
<laughs> you don't do that, you know. Oh, great. What's he got to say to us, you know? So, so he, he starts off with that, which isn't in the book on how to do a good sermon. But he goes this. He goes, I, mo- I most certainly understand now that God is not one to show partiality. But in every nation, the man who fears him and does what is right is welcome to him. You know? So Peter, Peter heard, he heard what the Spirit was saying in the vision. But he listened to it. And he went up and he obeyed it and he went there. And we know, uh, like I said earlier, while he was preaching, the Holy Spirit falls on them. They're prophesying and speaking in tongues. And he looks at the people with him and he says, well, if the Spirit falls on them the way it did to us, how do we not baptize them? So they baptize them. And then they get back to Jerusalem and they're like, what's this you were with Gentiles? And But when he's done telling the story, they say, well, God's coming to the Gentiles too. But it all starts with that one person listening to what God has to say. We have to listen to God. It was a game changer for Peter, and it was a game changer for the church. We need to be learning to listen. So Jesus listened, Peter listened, the Antioch leaders listened to the Spirit. Now this wasn't new to them. In Antioch, the prophet Agabus got up and said, a famine's coming to all the land. And they listened to it. They began to save money. And a few years later, they sent Barnabas and and Paul, or Saul at the time, they sent them to Jerusalem to bring a gift to help them with this time of famine. But this wasn't new for them. And what it tells us here, it says this. It says, Now there were prophets and teachers at Antioch and the church that was there, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius, uh, and a few others. Uh, And it says, and it says, while they were serving the Lord and fasting or ministering to the Lord and fasting, uh, the Holy Spirit said, set apart Barnabas and Saul, set Barnabas and Saul apart for me for the work which I have called them. And it says, Then when they had fasted and prayed, they laid their hands on them and sent them away. So it wasn't the same meeting that they sent them away. They said, look at what the Lord's saying. They took time and they fasted and prayed, and then they obeyed the Spirit and sent them on their trip. And so here, here they are listening to the Spirit. Now, put this in context. you got a, a growing church. It's doing well. People are hearing back in Jerusalem, God is working among the Gentiles in Antioch. In fact, this is where they were, people were first called Christians. They were, there were so many of them and they were so influential that the people of the town had to come up with a name for them instead of them. And they couldn't just call them Jews because they were Jews and Gentiles together, which made an impression on the city. And so they started calling them Christians. So you got this growing church, could even say flourishing church. And the Spirit says, give me your best two leaders, or two of your best leaders. I got something else for them to do. You know? We, we don't normally go for that. Churches want to gather in resources and hold on to them. You know? We want, to, we want to give away what, you know, what we maybe can get by without. But here the Spirit's saying, give me two of your best leaders. I got something else for them to do. And the leaders at Antioch said, this is the Lord speaking. Let's pray about this and let's, let's do this. And sent them on. And then we have our three trips. They came back to Antioch. They come back to Jerusalem and there. So they learn. They learn to to do that. We need to be a people learning to listen, always learning to listen. So you had the the three we've looked at, and then finally Paul's team listened on their journeys. We know that that Paul and Barnabas had a disagreement while they went, and when they went, they had all kinds of troubles. In one place, Paul literally, they didn't like what he had to say. They stoned him. 
And they didn't, you got to understand, when you stone somebody, it wasn't like, oh, let's throw rock, little rocks at them. They would take stones. And it says at one point that they l took his body outside the city and left him for dead. And then they found him, the believers found him and prayed for him. What was that like? I heard one guy say, was it like praying? And while you're praying, you hear bones clicking back together? But, you know, he, he's, he's virtually dead. And the next thing you know, he's back in the, he goes back to the same town. What up with that? You know, it's like you get out of jail, you go back to the same town. You know, but God, Paul, Paul listened. It says, it says at one point, let me get, oops, go back there. They passed through uh, the Pergean uh, and Galatian region, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. So here they are going through Asia, and we know they went to Galatia later, but here they're going through, and it says, don't, don't, don't preach here. And after coming to uh, Mycenae, they were trying to go to Bithynia, and the Spirit of Jesus did not permit them. And passing by by Mycenae, they came down to Troas. And it says, it says, while they were there, a vision appeared to Paul at night. A man of Macedonia was standing and appealing to him, saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. And when he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that God had, could, had called us to preach the gospel to them. Now, you got to understand here, in a couple of verses before, it tells us the Spirit said, don't preach in this region. And now a very specific call comes. This isn't, oh, you're going to go home tonight and just have one prayer time and say, this is what I'm going to do to upend my whole life. These, these are people who wrestled with the Spirit, who wrestled to hear God and tested what they were hearing and found out the hard way that, yes, they were hearing God, but that doesn't mean it's going to be all, you know, coasting on through. Now, I thought by the time I was 30 and doing pretty well in the Lord and stuff, that I was just going to coast the rest of the way. It was all going to be easy. And, that's, and then from then on in, I had heartaches and troubles. <laughs> I remember telling the Lord, what's going on here? You know? And the Lord said, did I promise you you wouldn't have heartache? No. What did I promise you? Oh, you promised you'd never leave me or forsake me. Well, I'm here. Lord. And so I'm okay. I'm okay. See, it all starts in a context of like, We'll go wherever God wants us to go. And trouble doesn't mean it's not the Lord. Trouble doesn't mean it's not the Lord. We have to, people, we have to be a people. I'm going to say, I keep saying learning. I mean that as an ongoing thing. I know how to hear the Lord. But the Lord may want to still say things to me at, at, at 70, however, 73 years old here that I may not want to hear, or that may be hard for me to hear, or that may take me to a place that I don't expect to go. But if I want to be a person that makes an impact for the Lord, maybe not like Paul, maybe not like Peter, but maybe like some of those unnamed people, for my generation, I need to always be learning to listen, always be willing to listen to what God has to say. Again, our writers say it requires a reorientation of one's heart and an opening of one's heart to what God thinks is best. What I think is best for me may not be what God thinks is best for me. It could mean allowing God to replace your ideas of God's plan for your life. You know, people have a lot of ideas for their lives. A couple of the testimonies we heard yesterday at the, uh, the breakfast we went to for FCA, we heard people say, well, you know, this one guy, he was the starting quarterback at his high school, and then he got benched, and it, everything in him wanted to quit. But the more he prayed about it, the more he knew he was supposed to stay there 
and show these teammates what it's like to undergo and to stand firm through disappointment. And he ended up a year later becoming the starting quarterback again. You know? It could mean allowing suffering to play a role in your future rather than trying to do everything possible to prevent suffering. And isn't that what we do? Isn't that what our whole world is geared up to? What can I do to avoid suffering? I've had people tell me, I can't be around to them. They're toxic. Now, I understand not immersing yourself in a toxic situation. But, you know, toxic people need a savior. And if you could have grace to be around them, you might be the very one that would reach their heart. So you have to listen to the Lord there. It may mean something as basic as studying the Bible each day and pouring out your heart to God in prayer and discovering some things there. And you know what's great? We don't have to just talk about this uh, in theory or even in, in generations past. We have it right among, among ourselves, you know. We, we're grateful. We're grateful that Ro, Ray and Joanne listened to the Spirit and instead of going the other places they had opportunity to go back in 2007, they came to a place that was more expensive, was more difficult to find a home in, uh, was colder than wherever else they were going to go. Things that maybe they didn't want, but they believed the Lord was telling them, go back and help Long Branch Covenant. And so they did that. And we have, we have uh, again, some of us saw him yesterday. We have Josh Bovo, the man we support. Josh, a number, I forget how many years ago it is now. Here, Josh has this thriving, flourishing business. And, and, and in his spare time in the summer, he would help FCA out with their surf camps because he's always surfing anyway in his free time. And he'd be with these kids and, and Harry Flaherty, who's, who's the head of New Jersey's FCA, said, you know, Josh, you're just so good at this. You should pray about doing this full time. You know, we could really use somebody to just be over Monmouth County schools and work there. And he's like, he's praying about it, and he's feeling this way about it, feeling that way about it. And so <clears throat> one morning, they're, they're, they're up, they're having their coffee, and he's talking with Jana, who's, they got five kids. And, uh, you know, she works full time, you know, to make ends meet for, the, for, you know, raising five kids. And if you've ever seen their boys eat, it's like feeding 10 kids. Oh, my goodness. So anyway, Josh and Jan are talking about this. And so he's telling all the stuff that he's feeling and what Harry said to him. And, and he says to Jana, so what do you think, thinking she's going to say, oh, Josh, it would be great if we didn't have, if the kids were all out, da, da, da. She looks at him and says, well, it's a no-brainer. We know God's telling you to do this. And he's like, oh, <laughs> you know. And I said, man, you must thank the Lord every day for that woman. I mean, if you don't know Jana Bova, you're missing out on a treat. She is, she is something else. But we have people among us. Some of you have made these kind of decisions to not do this and do this or to do this rather than do something else you would prefer to do. You know? It doesn't always mean that. But it all starts. It all starts with having a mindset, having a heart in a position that says, Lord, I want to hear. And when I say I want to hear, I want to heed what you have to say to me. And it'll make, you, it'll make you more confident because you're doing what God's telling you to do. It'll make you more generous because you'll be more like God. And, you know, things that you could get money for, you'll do for free. Things that you want to keep, you'll give away. That's what God does. That's what God does. But it'll change your life. And for many of us, it'll keep changing our lives. It'll keep changing our lives to be the people God calls us to be. Because we want to be, I think it was in Stephen's sermon, before they killed him, he spoke of David and he said, 
He served the purposes of God in his generation, and then he slept with his fathers. That's all we can ever hope to do, is serve the purposes of God in our generation. And that means in our children's generation, what we pass on to our kids and our grandkids. That's our call. But we will do it best if we learn to listen. Amen? Amen. Let's stand together this morning. Now, if you're here with us this morning and you've never, what I'm talking about sounds, well, whatever, but you've never given your heart to Jesus, he's calling you today. He's calling you to come and see that you need him, see that he's calling you and that he's got forgiveness for you for your sin, forgiveness for the selfishness that we all tend to live by. And he's got, for the best way to say, he's got a plan for your life. He wants, to, he wants to free you of the guilt of the things you've done. I don't forget the things I've done. You know, if, can I say it from the pulpit? I couldn't have lived like more of an ass than I was. I had to introduce Yvonne to people when we first were, were together. Oh, they knew me when, Yvonne, when I treated people like garbage. But I have a clean conscience about that now because the Lord has freed me from it. He's freed me from it. And every person can have that clean conscience. Amen? Amen. So we want to make sure we tell people about that all the time. And the way to get it is to just say, Jesus, I need you. You don't have to have a special prayer. You call out to him and he hears you. It's just like Paul said, I mean Peter said, those who seek him and do what's good, he is welcome to them. Father, we thank you that you've made us a people that know what it means to listen, Lord. Know what it means to listen to your word and heed what you say to us, Lord. And we confess, Lord, that sometimes we don't listen because we're comfortable or we're, we're concerned that you'll upset what's going on that we like, Lord. But we pray, Lord, that you'd always convict our hearts to listen, Lord that we might hear not only the challenging things you have to say to us, Lord, but the, the things you have to say to us that confirm us and affirm us and strengthen our hand and, and encourage us, Lord, to do the things you've called us to do. We pray that you'll keep working in us, Lord, to the end of our days, that we might be a people who serve your purposes in, in our generation. We trust you for that. And we ask you to work in us now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.